Well, hey, it's almost November, and I know that because I had to scrape my car this morning, which wasn't a lot of fun. But um, November is a good month. Historically, as some of you know, November is a, is a time when, uh, well, at least in the last few years, we have uh, done a number of things, uh, not the least of which taking up a special offering at the end of November that we've come to call the Great Giveaway. And the inspiration for this tradition, uh, I hate to call it a tradition, but it does get to be that after you do it a few times. But the inspiration for that is a couple of chapters that we find in the book of 2 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the, to the church in Corinth. So if you have your Bibles with you, you're more than welcome to please join me as we turn there. And you might even want to read that uh, at some point, uh, you know, this week. Or if uh, for some reason I lose you this morning, go ahead and read those chapters. But Paul kicks off the, the chapter by saying, Now I want to tell you, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done for the churches in Macedonia. Though they've been going through much trouble and hard times, their wonderful joy and deep poverty have overflowed into rich generosity. Now, there's kind of a background of what Paul is talking about here. And it began when he was wrapping up his third missionary journey. And he got to the city of uh, Corinth that he planted a, a year earlier on his second missionary journey. But his heart was sad as he came into Corinth. He was probably, you could see it on his face because he had just heard that there was a terrible famine in the city of Jerusalem. And the people who had been hit hardest by the famine were the Christians there, the church. And they were suffering so much. And so Paul is coming into Corinth and he's got this sad face and his spirit is sagging. And I love the way that Pastor James Ryle kind of tells the story, reading a little bit between the lines. But the Corinthian Christians, I'm sure, couldn't help but notice what was going on. And kind of like, you know, Paul, what's the, what's the matter here? Well, why the sad face? And he says, well, it's the, it's the Christians in Jerusalem. They're just in such bad shape and nobody's there to help them. And Well, the Corinthians kind of think about it for a while. And finally, they say to him, well, why don't we just take up a special offering for them? We're doing pretty well around here and we'll send it to Jerusalem with you when you go. Now, Paul, as you can imagine, is thrilled with this, this idea. He's like, you know, you do that. That's amazing. Well, look, it, I've got to head up north. I'm going to visit the pl- churches that I planted up in the province of Macedonia. And then I'm going to swing south when I come through here again. I'll pick up your gift and take it with me to Jerusalem. So you can imagine how excited Paul is here. And he heads up north to visit these churches, the churches in Berea and Thessalonica and Philippi. And when Paul gets up there into the northern province of Greece, he sees something he's not prepared for. The Christians in Macedonia are devastated by poverty. How poor were they? Well, Paul uses a word to describe their poverty that literally means to be bent over with hunger pangs. So Paul sees his, their poverty. I'm, I'm sure he's heartbroken for them, but I'm, I'm sure he also encouraged them with something like, hey, don't despair. The church in Jerusalem is suffering bad too, but when I told the Corinthians about it, they came up with this idea of taking up a great giveaway, a special offering. In fact, they're putting together gifts for me right now. I'm going to take with me to Jerusalem, and I'm sure Paul was able to encourage them. Hey, if God provided for the Jerusalem Christians, uh, then he'll provide for you too. So Paul is traveling through Macedonia, and we know he's uh, encouraging them and telling them the story of the generosity of the Corinthians. And my guess is that it was in Philippi where something amazing happened, because in the midst of their extreme poverty, it says that when Paul shared the story, they said to him, Hey, let us give. And I'm sure Paul was like, no, 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 don't don't get me wrong. I didn't tell you that story so that you could give. But they begged him. They had to beg him. And it says in verses 3 and 4, Paul says, I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the gracious privilege of sharing in the gift for the Christians in Jerusalem. How could they have seen that as a gracious privilege unless they were, like we've been talking about around here, looking forward to their treasure in heaven, their eternal reward that comes to those who are faithful? I want to press pause on this story, though, and address something that I know a few of you are probably asking. Some of you are tracking with me, and you you see Paul here boasting about the generosity of the Macedonians. And some of you are probably asking, hey, isn't this wrong? Isn't it wrong to talk about what you or what other people have given? 
You know, and, and probably the reason you might think that is because of something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is talking about giving and fasting and praying. And he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And one of the things that Jesus says is that when you give, then he says, you don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And some people have taken that teaching to mean that we should never, ever talk about what God has been doing in our lives as it relates to giving or in the lives of other people or fasting for that matter or praying. But in fact, what Jesus is actually getting at here is the motives, not not so much the sharing of it, but the motives. Why are you giving? Is it so that other people will do uh, will, will praise you for it? Is it so that other people will think highly of you? Or are you you just giving as an act of obedience? Because you're motivated to glorify God and to be responsive to the way that the Spirit is working within you. And the point of what Jesus is saying is that God will reward the person who does the right thing for the right reason. But sometimes people will use these verses in Matthew 6 as kind of a proof text, arguing that it's always wrong to tell people what, you or what others have given or prayed for or fasted. But, but that doesn't really make sense when you look at what Jesus said in the previous chapter. He said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, there is a time and a place, God says, where you talk a little bit about the, the good deeds that you've done or that you do it in such a way that people, not boasting about it, hopefully, not for public rec- recognition, hopefully, but that you share that in such a way that God can be glorified. For example, Jesus pointed out the widow, didn't, didn't he, who was at the treasury. And what did he do? He said, look at her. Look at it. Look at what she's done. She's giving her last two coins. Well, how would he do that if it was supposed to be a secret always? Or you have in the book of Acts a lot of examples of Christians selling their, position, or their possessions and giving them to the church. In fact, in Acts 4, it says Barnabas sold a field, gave it to the church. And, and, and can it be wrong Or was it wrong then that others were made aware of that generosity? Was it wrong? No. How do we know it's not wrong that others were made aware of his generosity? Because the Bible tells us what he did. (laughs) Right? So we know that there is a time and a place to humbly and appropriately tell others, this is what God has done in our lives, whether it's through your ministry or through your prayers or just in the area of giving. And, uh, and God moves his people. And we don't need to then say, well, let's never, ever, ever talk about what God is doing in the area of generosity. And so that's why in the second letter to the Corinthian church, the Apostle Paul really spends two chapters of his letter just devoted to talking about the generosity of the Macedonians. And he wants to let the faithful deeds of these church plants just shine like a city on a hill for everyone to see. The reality is, folks, that money talks. It's not the only thing. But money does talk. One of the most powerful ways that we can give testimony to to our God is when there's evidence, humble evidence, that we're willing to put our trust in God and not in the almighty dollar. You know, when people give out of their wealth to put up a hospital wing named after them, that's a good thing, but there's nothing miraculous about that, right? They They got paid off. Their name is on the wing. When a guy gives a couple of dollars to the kids next next door for a school trip and gets a couple of, you know, bars of chocolate for it in return. Hey, that's a great thing. Don't get me wrong, but it's not miraculous. When somebody pays to enter a golf tournament in the name of some charity and they get, you know, like some door prizes and they have a fun afternoon with his buddies. That's great. Don't get me wrong, but there's nothing about that that makes us go, wow, God is amazing. Right? Right? Or even when some guy makes billions of dollars and then he sets up a charity to spend the billions that he can't even hope to spend. Again, don't get me wrong, it's great, but there's nothing that's miraculous about that. But when ordinary, regular folks, faithfully and sacrificially, those who are wealthy and those who are not wealthy, when they set aside money and give up the things that they want in order that others might have what they need, oh, the world stands up and takes notice of that. When people say no to themselves so they can say yes to God, yes to God's calling, yes to other people hearing about Christ, yes to the poor having their needs met. And when they say no to themselves and their desires, it's just not natural for human beings to give like that. And so money talks. And so sometimes there is a time and sometimes there's a place where we just humbly 
talk with others about the amazing things, not that we've done, but that God has done through the generosity that we've seen in others or even ourselves. We don't do it because we hope somebody will say, hey, how great is that? How great is that church? But we do it because we long to demonstrate to the world that there is a God, that this God is so great that we have just offered our lives to him. And and we want to live a way that is reflective of and congruent with the kingdom that is coming when Jesus appears. Now, when it comes to the generosity of the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, man, did they give. Oh, man, did they give. It's not the amount they gave. It's the sacrifice that they gave with. And Paul says that out of extreme poverty, he says they came up with what he called a wealth of generosity. In fact, there was so much to carry back to Jerusalem. The Macedonians have to send a few of their own down with Paul to carry the thing and then put it on a boat. And I'm sure those Macedonians can't wait to get to Corinth and say, thanks, guys, for the inspirational idea. So Paul is up north and he's bundling up these gifts that the Macedonians have given. And he's getting ready to head south. All of a sudden, a thought comes into his mind. It's an awful, horrible, terrible thought. And he breaks out in a cold sweat just thinking about it, I can imagine. See, Paul remembers the Corinthians promise about a year ago that they'd given. On the strength of that promise, Paul was just boasting about their generosity all the way up north. But then Paul is starting to think, what if I get there and I find out they've changed their mind? Oh, that's going to be embarrassing. I mean, what if the Corinthians, you know those Corinthians, what if they've cooled in their enthusiasm? How embarrassing is that going to be? And so the Apostle Paul, crafty man he is, writes a nice little letter with a little bit of gentle pressure to say, look at, deliver on what you promised. And so he says in verse 10, I suggest that you finish what you started a year ago, for you were the first to propose this idea and the first to begin doing something about it. Now I want to step back from this time and just make an observation. The Apostle Paul is talking about a lot of different churches here. You've got the Jerusalem church out east, and then in, the, in, the, the, in Greece you've got the, um, the Corinthian church in the south, in the province of Achaia, and you've got the Macedonian churches up north. And what are they all doing? What are all these churches doing? They're helping each other. They're giving to each other. They're supporting each other. They're actually spurring and challenging one another with their generosity. I think it's amazing. I studied this passage when we did our first great giveaway in 2006, and I made the observation then that the New Testament model of generosity is not just individuals giving to their church, which I always thought was the norm, and that is the norm, but it's also, in addition to that, other churches taking up offerings and giving them to other churches and ministries. And so the Bible doesn't just teach individuals to give. The Bible teaches churches to look out and to be generous and not just to absorb all of the resources that come into their hands. The fact is, when you give to Gateway, some of what you give results in a blessing to you. Maybe the programs or the staff or the building or the, you know, there's a blessing that you can receive from those giving. But in my opinion, there's something very exciting about just taking up a whack of, 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 of money in an offering and just sort of sending it out to churches or to ministries that will not benefit us personally. We will not see the blessing of that, but others will. There's just something exciting about that. Because these stories of generosity that are out there have a domino effect, inspiring others to do the same. In chapter 9, verse 2, after pretty much talking them out of their wallets, Paul says, I know your readiness of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia, that's their province, has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. The word stirred up there is the word provoke provoking is going on in these verses. You see that the need of the Jerusalem church provoked the Corinthians to promise to give. And the promise of the Corinthians provoked the Macedonians to actually give sacrificially out of their, out of their own poverty. And that now is a story that Paul is using to provoke the Corinthians to be generous and to make good on their promise. And now this whole story is provoking us as a church. And I love how, you know, the Corinthians are probably sitting there going, are we, are we going to take this line down? Are we going to let those hillbillies up north outgive us? No way. Not on our watch. Friends, wouldn't it be great if we just provoked one another individually and, and as a church, we stirred one another up to acts of generosity? You know, in 2006, here in Caledonia, we were going through a very difficult situation. Look, looking back, we were in a, in a battle zone. Many of you lived through that time here and... and um, we were the only building uh, 
site on, in town at the time. And in the midst of us, our elders prayed and felt compelled to stay, take up at a special offering. We decided that half of it we would give to a church in Cambodia that our missionary Bill Labasu had told us about. Our offering that day paid for the building. And here it is, New Jerusalem Church. And we did our English camp out of that this summer. And, and again, please understand, we didn't pay for the land, which was much more expensive. But we did in that one day pay for the cost of the building itself. And I had a chance to preach there on the Sunday morning that we were there. And Pastor David, their pastor, personally came up to me. And he said, please tell your church, Gateway, thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you, thank you so much. The other half that year that we we collected, we gave to an evangelical church on the Six Nations Reserve where a friend of mine was the pastor. They needed to renovate their building. And we were looking for an opportunity to say, hey, we love you in the midst of this challenge that we're going through. And I want you to understand, it's not that we had too much money that year, but just that God was knocking on the door of our hearts that we should set aside something. And we set a goal of of 10% of our general fund, and we exceeded that goal. And, And it was so exciting. And you should have seen the look on my friend's face, that pastor at the Six Nations Church, where I just handed him this check, and I said, we love you. This is just a token of of our love for you and for your church. It doesn't come with any strings attached. If there's anything we can do to help, we just care. Let us know. And and it was awesome. That next year, then, we took up a great giveaway. We raised about uh, about $60,000 in one day, and we gave half of it to Ambrose University College and half of it to our Brantford church plant. And because money talks, that story of that one-day giveaway kind of went viral, and it got out there. And the Canadian Alliance family decided that they'd take something from a page from our book. And that one-day offering was taken up in churches all over Canada later that spring. And it was announced that over uh, about a million and a half dollars was raised in one Sunday. You see how that generosity just dominoed? It wasn't that we did anything special, but God took it and it snowballed into something that we could never have anticipated. Today, Ambrose has a new campus. You can see it there. They have about twice as many students as they had back then. They have a new residence now in the works. The dominoes keep falling, keep falling. The snowball keeps getting bigger. My home church where I grew up, Owen Sound Alliance, heard about a great giveaway and they wanted to get in on the act. So they asked me to come up and talk to them about partnering with us in church planting. They knew that we'd given 30000 to our church planting fund in one day and they said we can do better than those upstarts in Caledonia. They agreed, agreed to give us $50,000 over the next two years. And because of their partnership, we have a church in Bramford today that averages over 100 people on Sundays, meeting the needs of, of, of people there in that city. We also have a church plant in Bimbrook that is meeting on the first and third Sunday of every month in a public worship gathering. Then Owen Sound didn't want to stop there. I mean, they had already kind of embarrassed us by giving more, but they gave a, was, uh, a massive whack of money to Crossings Community Church, a church plant in Acton. And then they gave another massive um, amount of money to Ambrose and seriously outgave us. And I was like, how dare those country bumpkins up in Owen Sound? <laughs> Claiming the mantle of the most generous church in our district, not on, not on our watch. So the next year we took up an offering for a compassion needs of people in our community. Half of it went into a compassion fund that has been overseen by a, a great compassion team here at Gateway. And God has enabled us to meet so many needs in our community since then. And... Uh, now, is it wrong for us to talk about this? You know, in our family, we talk sometimes about our failures and our shortcomings. But we also talk sometimes about the great moments. When our kids were born, we recount that all the time. Or when our kids came to faith in Christ or the different things that God did, the miracles and the answers to prayer and stuff like that. We talk about it sometimes just to remind us that we have an awesome God. Not hopefully so that other people will say, oh, how good are you? Not at all. But just so that we can say we serve an awesome God who does things, takes little things that we do and just blows them up and snowballs them into things that that we couldn't even predict. And so we just want to do this to praise God. It would be wrong if we were doing these things because we wanted others to look at us and praise us. But it wouldn't be wrong if we wanted to be open-handed with the God who saved us of our sins and who loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. Well, there's nothing wrong with talking about what the Lord has done to give him glory and to give him honor for his goodness. That year, we created our Compassion Fund. We gave the other half of the great giveaway to a new ministry that our international workers, Rich and Elisa Brown, started called Casablanca in Quito, Ecuador. 
It's a place where there's ministry that takes place for young moms that are coming out of prison. We raised $66,000 in one day. Again, more than 10% of our annual general fund offerings just to say, eat that, Owen Sound. No, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Last year, we took up a great giveaway offering at the end of November, and half of it we gave to support 20 people that we were trusting God would send to Cambodia this past summer, and exactly 20 people, there they are, we went and we helped them to go. The other half we gave to our global advance fund that pays for our international missionary workers to minister on our behalf all over the globe, and it was running low, and so we gave it there. And this past June, I received an invitation to speak to a group of pastors and delegates at the Midwest Canadian District Conference of the Alliance. It was in Morden, Manitoba. Isn't that just your greatest dream is to be sent to Morden, Manitoba? But they asked me to come and I took Ray Bebbington along who does some budget counseling and did that for some pastors there. And I just, they, they wanted to know about our great giveaways. And I told them about some of our failures because I could just, I re- could regale you with, you know, with tales of, of our failures all day long. But I also told them about the generous people at Gateway Church because I am so proud of you. And uh, I am. I just want to be honest with you. I'm just so thrilled that I have the opportunity to be associated with such a a wonderful church. And we've got lots of faults and we're the most imperfect church with the most imperfect pastor, mind you. But it's like this. Some of you have heard this statement. The more I get to know people, the more I like my dog. Have you ever heard that before? Wait for it. You just have to wait for it a little. Well, I say, you know, the more I talk to other pastors, the more I love my church. And uh, yeah, I do. So uh, I'm going to brag about the generosity of my church to people. And uh, I just say Paul did it first. So, you know, if he could do it, I'll do it. And I'm just so grateful. I'm so flattered to be a part of, of what God has been doing here. And I said to these, to these pastors of, of this district, I said, I hereby throw down the gauntlet. And I challenge you here in the Midwest District to outgive us in the Central Canadian District. I said, we Macedonians challenge you Achaeans. I said, I dare you to give away more money to missions and to church planting and to compassion than we do. I hear now dare you to take up an offering in one day and give more than 10% of your general fund away completely to something that just blesses others and not yourselves. And I said, when you do, give me a call and tell me what you did. And if you want, thumb your nose in our general direction. But challenge us to outgive you because there's nothing that we hate here in Ontario as some too big for their britches church in you know Manitoba or Saskatchewan getting all high and mighty thinking they can outgive us. How dare you think you can give more? <laughs> I can't describe for you what it was like in that in that service. As I was talking like this and it's like the spirit moves because money talks and one guy actually just yelled out that he was gonna take up our challenge. Because there's perhaps no greater evidence that God is alive and well in the world today than the miracle of seeing people say no to the false gods of materialism and hedonism and saying yes to giving, to sacrificing, and sharing with others so that others can know about Christ, so that the world might hear, that poor people might be taken care of in the name of Jesus. Because we got all eternity to enjoy the talents and the treasures and the time that God has given us. And we've just got a short opportunity here to make a difference. There's no greater proof that God is alive and that, and that he rewards those who seek them. No greater witness. Words are cheap, as you know. Plans are worthless, but money, money does talk. It's not the only thing but money does. And God says that he loves the person who gives cheerfully. And the, actually, the word cheerfully there is the Greek word hilaros, where we get our word hilarious. Some people say, give until it hurts. I'm like, no, 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 that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, give until you giggle. Do you know what I'm talking about? I can promise you this. Give until you're like, oh, <laughs> okay, God. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Give until you giggle. There's, no, there's nothing that makes us giggle like a church than when we just take up this huge whack of money and we give to something that has no benefit to us. We just send it out like that and we're just like, <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do, God, but this is incredible. It's so freeing, it's so wonderful. And the great giveaways that we've done, you know, I just remember the first one we did, we waited and waited as the money was counted up and we sang the longest worship set in the history of non-Pentecostal Christianity. And when the amount was finally announced and we blew away our goal, we just laughed and giggled and giggled. It was just like, (laughs) I 
can't believe it. God, you, <laughs> there are no words. God loves a cheerful, fearless, giggling giver. God loves a fearless, cheerful, giggling church. I dare you. I love this quote from A.W. Tozer. He said, God is looking for those whom he, through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do ourselves. I love that quote. You know, if you just attempt to do what you can do, that's all you'll get out of life. No answers to prayer, no real excitement, just sitting in the pew Sunday after Sunday, just putting in your time, that's what you'll get. I came up with what I think is a really clever saying. So clever, it goes like this. Are you ready? This is so profound. It kind of summarizes what he says here. Here's how it goes. If you only do what you can do, you'll only do what you can do. I was thinking of putting that on a t-shirt or maybe a mug or something like that. Maybe an inspirational poster. Okay, it's not that good. But work with me here. Work with me here. Think about this. Isn't it true? If you only do what you can do, if that's all you ever attempt, if that's all you ever go for, then all you'll ever do is what you can do. And I don't know about you, but I'm just not satisfied with that. I'm just not happy with living that kind of life. And I hope you're not either. And so as a church family, we see that God has said in his word that we're to humbly give glory to God as we talk about the generosity that we see around us. Not to brag about ourselves, to provoke one another to love and good deeds as we lift up Christ. And giving is not just where individuals give to their local church, but where churches look outside. They look out and they let go in response to the need. With that being said, it won't surprise you then to hear me say that we're going to take up another great giveaway and it's going to be on November the 27th. Every dollar that comes into the building, we are just going to seek to give that away. Half of it is going to go to something local. This is what we do. And half of it is going to go to something global. And they both have sort of a church planting feel to them. Let's start with the global half. In Cambodia, Bill and Alana Labazu, our international workers have two dorm facilities. One of them is uh, up here for our university students. One is for women, the other for men. And they currently house 22 students, 11 each dorm. They're teaching and training them to be pastors or to be effective leaders in the Cambodian church as they graduate. They're also teaching English out of these places and computer classes and they're crowded and they can't do all they want. They also want a place where they can run the English camps and also in the churches, but in a place where there are more conducive facilities to that. They have a monthly student worship time that they want to ex- expand that into a church plan so that they can have a church that is reaching the university age students in their city. And if you just walk around Phnom Penh, what you will see on the streets is just a massive number of young people driving their motos. It is unbelievable how many people there are that live in that uh, country who are under the age of 25. The opportunity is ridiculous. The problem is the dorms are full. Their leases end on these places in just over a year. And they want to move, whether it's into a long-term lease or ideally even into a place where they can own a facility that they can purchase. It would be approximately $200,000 for them to buy a place like what they want or it would be um, about $20,000 a year to rent it. But they want to make that move so they can expand their dorm ministry, expand their English camp ministry and reach university-age students with a church plant. And what they're in need of in need of is financing that would allow them to either begin renting or to sustain payments. And so the global half of our great giveaway is this awesome opportunity to get them started on something more in terms of their facility. Now let me tell you about the local half. Here at Gateway, we have a church planting fund, and we've used that church planting fund for a number of years to plant churches. And we have one in Brantford that is led by Cal Stafford, the lead pastor there. And we have a church plant in Bimbrook, and they're led by Greg Langman, the lead pastor there. This year, we began a discernment process of seeking the Lord and asking him, are we being asked to plant a church in Cuga? And we don't know the answer to that yet. We've been praying, and they've been meeting for fellowship gatherings, and they're going to be meeting over the Christmas holidays for a worship service. They are in their own community and they've been doing compassion ministry and they've been growing and we see good movement there and we haven't yet made a decision. But that's something that we're seeking to discern. And so we have Bramford and Bimbrook, something cooking up in Cuga, but that's not all. But two months ago, I got a call from a young guy, young pastor by the name of Aaron Gerard. You can see him up on the screen. He's 32 years old. They've got a son, a daughter. He's married to Shay. He, um, you can pray for him. He's a Winnipeg Blue Bombers fan, and he cheers for the Ottawa Senators. So he's got a lot of growth to do in his spiritual journey. But, but great, 
great guy. You know, he moved in, into the Hamilton area to f- finish a master's degree, actually. Just moved in for about 10 months and then moved back to Regina where he has family but hasn't been able to shake the feeling that God is calling him back to this area to start a church. Well, to make a long story short, uh, Aaron and Shay came out here a few weeks ago. I spent a day and a half with them. And the decision that we have made us, as we've prayed about it and walked with the elders in this is that we want to bring Aaron on staff here as soon as possible in the new year. A quarter of his time, he's going to be working here at Gateway, ministering to you, helping me with some of my expanding responsibilities, which is going to be excellent. And we're going to be paying for that portion of his salary. But three quarters of his time is going to be spent developing a church plant either in the Ancaster or Dundas area. And so in a couple of weekends, I'm actually flying Aaron in here. He's going to meet with you. He's going to be preaching here on Sunday, November the 13th. On the Saturday evening, on the 12th of November, there's going to be a dessert night that we want to host. We plan to introduce you to Aaron, we'd love for you to come out, particularly those who come from Hamilton, to just get to know him and share in his calling and story. These are such exciting days at Gateway. And so the local half of our great giveaway on November the 27th is going to go to just into our church planting fund to make this church plant possible. Now, right now, our church planting fund is being exhausted and it's going this way. It's going down. And if we want to take advantage of these opportunities that God is leading us into, it's going to be essential that we have the finances that enable us to move forward as God is leading us as a church family. My question to you folks is, are you willing to be part of this journey? Do you believe that God has called us as a church family to be that which looks out beyond ourselves and lets go? Is there something inside of you that maybe because of the, 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 the biblical example of the churches in Macedonia, is there something inside of you this morning that is provoked in a good way, provoked to say, I'm willing to sacrifice that which God has given me, that other people might hear the good news in Cambodia, that we might have churches in this area, churches that are preaching the good news and bringing the witness of Christ there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have much to learn in this journey. And we pray, Father, that as a church family, we would be provoked in such a a powerful way by your Holy Spirit now. I pray, Father, that we would become generous, more generous than we have even been. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would trust you more and more. Help us, Heavenly Father, for you've been asking us to do some things that are just further beyond anything we could ask or imagine in our own strength and power. Would you please provide us, not just, Lord, with the finances and resources to do these things, but would you provide us, Lord, with the prayer covering that this needs? Would you help us to wash and bathe this entire thing in prayer? Would you guide us, Lord Jesus, to be a church that sees the needs of others and is willing to put those things in front of our own care and comfort? We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to make all these decisions now that we need to make in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.